Hi, everyone. Pastor Galen, lead pastor at Shine Hills Church. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope that these podcasts will be a real encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. You can also connect with Shine Hills at shinehills.org. Hope you enjoy the program. We are across the street and around the world. Shine Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. And Nathan, we're going to continue on because I want to talk about the second part of our um, uh, what I introduced last last time was talking about the Jesus Revolution, the movie. Okay. Right? Now you haven't seen the movie, you said I haven't, but you've read the book, so you've read the, you you've got read the, through uh, a, about a quarter, a third of the book. Okay. Yeah. So, so one of the questions that I had when I left is, what is the what is the issue today that mm-hmm. is the hippie movement? So I guess as a pastor, you know, as I looked at uh, Chuck Smith, he's the Calvary Chapel pastor that was, he was, he looked to me, I, I probably should do the math and figure out when it started and how old he was, but he looked like he was 60 years old. So I was thinking, okay, okay. what is, as a 60 year old, and he was kind of, they called him the square, right? He was square about, um, Issues of the day, the hippie movement, nineteen seventy-two. I love those was terms. Starting to come on the full square. on, <laughs> yeah. And they were they were all about the, you know, getting out there and getting away and dropping out and, you know, get you know, kind of, the ecstasy of the drugs and all that was you know yeah. the ecstatic thing to have this connection, this ex- experience and, yeah. so anyway, and, and this hippie comes along and is it right into his but who had become faith in Christ. This guy named uh, uh, Freeze, and uh, his daughter actually brought him and said, "Okay, here's a hippie. Talk to him." And but this hippie had been God found him in the gutter and mm-hmm. reju- rejuvenated his life. And basically, he said, "Okay, if you want to reach people like me, here's what you got to do." And yeah. I so it, as a pastor, I'm thinking, "Okay, I'm more Chuck Smith age. Yeah. I'm more Chuck Smith square. Maybe I'm, I'm setting my ways." What is the issues of the day? What are the things that we could do as a church? So what's what is the issue of the day that's hippie like that we aren't uh, reaching and then how can we reach them? Boy, that's a big question because you look at the book, the setting of the book is 1972. Yep. And so you look at you're coming through the end of the Vietnam era. Yeah, that's right. Um you have the of course in 1968 a whole lot of things had happened. Um, and by 1972, you're in the midst of the Watergate scandal, I oh, think. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, this is all before I was even born by uh, over half a decade or more. But you look at all those things. There's a lot of things going on in society. I, I would say that uh, maybe one of the differences between then and now is you go from the era of Jack Kennedy and uh, a lot of faith, uh, well, especially even before that, uh, Eisenhower. And a lot of faith in in national leadership, mm-hmm. and then um, by the time you get to the Watergate scandal, you come through the Johnson years and into yeah. the Nixon years. People are just very angry, and I would say yeah. that there are some strong parallels. I think so too. I, uh, to I, today, I, you know. So I was ten years. I mean, I was born in sixty two. So I was ten years old in nineteen seventy two, and I remember high school kids going off and going to Colorado Springs. Some of my friends brothers and sisters uh-huh. had kind of got into the drug scene and were gone off and been hippies okay. and singing all the, you know, yellow submarines and all that, you know, the whole, the whole hippie movement. I, I got to see it. I remember it. Did you get long Burn- hair and wear Birkenstocks well, or? No, I never had Birkenstocks. I had, I had hair that covered the, my ears for sure, but I, I never really was into the hippie thing. I saw it and okay. I thought, I, that doesn't, it was all the drugs and you yeah. know the burning of incense and there was oh, the beads yeah. in front of the doors and all the the paraphernalia that, that you get you saw that drug stuff and anyway yeah you know it was a real certainly drug sex rock and roll and I was ten years old and I yeah. took all this in and I it was kind of a I don't get it and I we we used to go to Colorado Springs and drive around the square that town square and you would just you know, there's just hippies everywhere, just hanging out, yeah. playing guitars, you know, peace and love and and uh, smoking weed and whatever. They're doing their thing. Wow. And so I remember those images. Right. And so when I watched this, I thought, oh, I remember the hippie movement. I don't remember the Jesus movement, meaning 
what Chuck Smith, you know, what happened in his living room. And so it was fascinating to me because I remember that the look and that I remember all those things, the vans that people used to drive. I remember seeing all those things. And, uh, and I, I don't know. I just, as I enjoyed watching how Chuck Smith is square, you know, mm-hmm. square peg, round hole, if you want to call it that. And, and how he was influenced by this hippie who had come to Christ to open up to, um, and, and the, so this freeze, who was this hippie that come to Christ mm-hmm. said, listen, uh, Chuck, these these hippies are looking for the same thing. They're looking for love. Mm. We're looking for it in all the wrong places. All the wrong places. And so yeah. I don't know. I just thought I was. It's endearing. It's like man. And then I got to think, what are we doing today? That's that we're missing it. Well, you know, I I can't address either 1970 or. <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of what's going on today, while there are parallels, there are also strong differences as well. Yeah. Um, and so I think what, what I could, what could, we could probably talk about that would be productive is the heart of a Christian. And, and I, I guess I could actually come at this from the perspective of the, the way the Christian church in the United States of America has performed, say, since the 1920s. Okay. And there has been a lot of cultural strife, there's no doubt, and it has definitely crept into the church. Yeah. When when you look at from about 1970, so going backwards a little bit in church history, in, in American church history, about 1970 began the rise of something at the original, at, at, at that time it was known as American fundamentalism. And it wasn't bad initially, we're talking 1870. Okay. What had happened is in 1869 really is when Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species had begun to creep into American, not only universities, but American seminaries. And it drove a lot of people to ask a lot of questions about the origin of the universe and ask some pretty deep questions about God. Okay. Let me ask you a historical question right yeah. now. So I had, I think I just read this recently and I want to square it with you, that Darwin was in London. Is that right? Uh, yes. And, 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 or say, England, yeah. In 1870, and across town, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was was preaching to the masses. Wow, yeah. Is that the same time? I think that they would have been uh, contemporaneous. Yeah. Uh, Darwin would have been an old man. And the reason oh, well, why gotcha. the reason why we, we look at 1869 is a lot of these conversations had been swirling in Europe. But much of that conversation had been held at bay as a result of the American Civil War. And so we were so concentrated on a completely different issue that it begun to affect American society a little later. Yeah, that's true. There were some great people that really surrounded a gentleman by the name of D.L. Moody mm-hmm. uh, that began to push back on, on some of the influences that were creeping in from Europe. And it wasn't just Charles Darwin. Uh, German higher criticism, German rationalism had begun to an, infect European seminaries. And so as a result, there was this whole group of individuals that were saying, listen, there are, uh, you can say a lot of things about a lot of different things in regards to the Bible, but you can't believe any less than these basic fundamental principles and truly call yourself a Christian. Yeah. So that began about uh, 19 or 18, I'm sorry, 1870. And it continued onwards until about 1920. Okay, so just real quick, uh-huh. when the things that were creeping in, would that be rationalism? Yes. That would have been one of the big ones. And often called German higher criticism or German theology at the time. So is that that's the same as rationalism? It's like, what is truth, basically, the question? Basically, but but it was with a specific application of of how does one view the Bible? Okay. And, and so they, for instance, that's when they came up with that infamous GEDP yeah. theory regarding yeah, 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 yeah. The, the the first five books Origins, of the Bible yeah. and, and all those different things. Right. And so you you have a lot of different things, and they were okay. many of them unfounded, uh, they, but they were trying to higher criticism. Is lower criticism is something every Christian does. You look at what the Bible is saying and you try to think of it very carefully. Yeah. Higher criticism assumes the human being, the person, to be a higher authority and we critique the Bible in a Marxist fashion. Uh, is actually so, very dangerous. So that's where the higher criticism snuck into yeah. America. Okay, and so this would be 1880s, 90s? Yeah, right, up, up, in, up through the early 1900s. Early 
1900s. And about so, 1912, a group of people, uh, actually they were funded by, I forget, it was not uh, Montgomery Ward or Sears or something like that, but one of those famous, uh, there was a major entrepreneur. They huh. left their name off of it. They just called themselves two Christian laymen. It was two brothers that were very wealthy. Huh. They funded a whole series of booklets called The Fundamentals. Okay. They mailed millions of wow. copies to pastors all over the country. I have, there was 12 total. I have eight of those. So it was a lot of a behavioral type things? No. It was actually talking about the virgin birth, oh, the blood atonement, gotcha. uh, the deity of Christ, yeah. uh, the virginity of Mary. All those, we're talking very basic principles. Sure. And their point was, these are integral to yeah. the on this Christian hill. faith. Yeah. yeah. Die on this hill. And it. so the great editor of that was R.A. Torrey who was yep. one of the early leaders of Biola Seminary, Biola right. College in, in Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Yeah. And so this really set the stage, and, and that was called the Irenic phase. It was generally peaceful because the vast majority of Americans were in full agreement with those core values. Okay. But basically in the late 19, mid to late 1920s, there was a fundamental shift. Many of the seminaries had begun to go very, what we would call today, woke. Huh. They were liberal. And so you take, for years, Princeton University yep. was believed exactly what you and I do. Yep. G. Gresham Machen was one of the great speaker uh, uh, leaders of that. Uh, the Dr. B.B. Warfield yep. was the oh, yeah. uh, seminary Huge. president. Yeah. And so after he passed, in the next generation, a bunch of very liberal individuals came in and took what was the eminent seminary and turned it liberal. Okay. And there began a series of clashes in the American theological landscape between what was called liberalism, which is generally the German higher critical perspective, yeah. and what was initially known as fundamentalism. Now, back in that early phase, what it literally was just saying was there are fundamental truths. Right. But that began to break down more and more and more until in the 1950s, we, there were just people, it seemed like they were at theological war with one another. Then there was a new rise called neo-evangelicalism, initially starting off hoping to Okay, what year well. now we neo- 1950. Okay. And in 1950, one of the eminent, a couple of the leading folk in neo-evangelicalism early on was, one guy was a hero, a couple of them were heroes, but uh, Carl F.H. Henry. Okay. who began to back away from it, as, as but he later was uh, an eminent theologian in the Southern Baptist Convention. And then the most famous neo-evangelical early on was Billy Graham. Okay. And so what they were trying to do is say, all right, we want to have conservatism, but with a kind heart. Okay. The problem is, by the 1960s leading up to 1970 and somewhere in that phase, that time frame, it actually wound up adopting many of the uh, uh, very liberal principles of the previous liberal generation. Oh, wow. And so it became a real problem. We enter then this divided phase. And that's about the time we find in 1970, yeah. where you have churches that are used to, for decades now, battling one another on everything under the sun. And I grew up. That's in a, a good in, point. Battle, battling each other, really, right. not battling society, but right. battling each other. And initially, they were battling for very important things. Yeah. But then it began to devolve into things like how long should your hair be? Yeah. Should you wear a beard or not have a beard? Yeah. Should women wear pants or not? Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard people preach against uh, wire rim glasses. Hmm. Uh, I've heard people preach against having uh, a tag on the back of your shirt. I have no idea why. I've just heard some strange oh my stuff. Gosh. You've yeah. Right. I hope, did you grow up in that world? I grew up in what was called. And in the very worst sense, fundamentalism. Yeah. And so so let me just ask this question. So fundamentals started off good, you know, authority yeah. of Scripture, deity right. of Christ, virgin birth, all the... I mean, we those are the things we know. It's like if if we lose those, if you, 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 you know, you basically lose the inspiration of Scripture, right? Right. Okay, so that you're saying, did it veer off and go into all these other... It did. Okay. So instead of it being about principles anymore, it really became centered about. around personalities. Uh, okay. And as a result, every one of them, like the Pharisees used to yes, do, the Pharisees, exactly. they, they would basically say, I'm close. I'm better than you are because I believe this weird thing. Or yeah. then the another one, oh, I'll one up you on that one. Yeah. And it continued down this path that became really an aberration. The original individuals fighting for what they called the fundamentals of the faith mm -hmm. would have 
probably not recognized what it became oh, by sure. that point. For sure. Okay. And so that, honestly, that hung on for a little bit longer. I think, uh, you know, we went to some a church that, you know, when we were in Dallas, mm -hmm. that I had never seen anything like this. And they, they kind of laughed about it, but, you know, they couldn't play cards, but they could play dominoes. You know, yeah. they couldn't go to movies, but they, right. you know, so it was like. <laughs> You're describing my life. Yeah. It's like, that's a, that's a. It was kind of phasing out, and that would right. have been late '80s when that. Had to well, I lived it all the way up until, and in certain areas, primarily in the American Southeast. So, in the Southeast. Bible Belt, you'll still find it is it is shrinking, because the there are a lot of people who grew up that way, who recognize the original intent and loved what R.A. Torrey and, and uh, D.L. Moody and, and you get to B.B. Warfield and J. Gresham Machen and all those great heroes early on, what they were aiming at, we fully identify with that. Yeah. But what it became is something that's wrong. So today, people that believe like you and I would generally go by the term conservative evangelical. Okay, right. Because what they're saying is we're not whatever that was, but we certainly do believe in the biblical uh, the the core biblical principles right. that um, that are foundational to Christianity. Right. So okay, so that's a great history. So yeah, it runs and we we still have uh, there's still smoke from on on our clothes from some of those things. Absolutely. I mean, to say that we're completely free of bickering yeah. amongst ourselves in churches. I mean, that's there's we disagree on stuff. I don't know what is baptism and who knows what communion. Yeah. There's a there's plenty of things we disagree on. Um, Within, but with our society, the gap of of an evangelical in society, mm -hmm. that one has grown to. It's not like we disagree. It's almost like there's, uh, if if we bring to the fore, this is what we believe. That sounds like hate speech, and so this right. gap, this chasm between. So how do, what what Chuck Smith did in that particular yeah. day to bridge the gap, to the the hippie movement. Um, was it was endearing. I loved watching it. I was like, man, this guy, he just he just laid down all these his thoughts and traditions and whatever and just went with it and God used it and it's just been amazing. I mean this right. it's the the genesis of uh the uh Calvary Chapel movement. It's nationwide, yeah. worldwide. You know, it's just right. mass massive. Um and it's not that old of a movement. No. I mean, 1972, that's 50 right. years. That's not a long time. Well, you and I both have a very, very, I know for both of us, a very close friend here in this town, pastor of the Calvary Chapel Church here, Sean yeah, Sells. Yeah, Sean, yeah. Who's one of the godliest men I know. Oh, he's great. He is such a brother. Yeah. And you look at the what what he's aiming at, and I think it is the original intention of of Chuck Smith. Yeah. Is, is wonderful. And... I think if you were to, I, I think I know where you're going, and let me try this on and see what your response might be. All right. So when you looked at the the, the cultural Christianity, especially through that the whole divided phase and everything else, all of the cult, the internal Christian culture wars, if you will, and then he sees a group of people who are hurting, who are passionately in pursuit of love, but looking, as you've said already, in, in all the wrong places. Right. And then finally, someone punches through the barrier and says, listen, would you just come preach Jesus to us? Yeah. And he's like, okay, I can do that. Yeah. And I don't think that he stepped, and it's very clear, he did not step away one bit from the fun, foundational truths that's true. of the Christian that's, message. That's a real good point. But he's he willing to share it with anyone. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the things I guess we can ask ourselves the question, do we demand that people clean themselves up to come to church? No, no, for or sure. Or do we say, please come to church and we'll help you? No. Okay, Yeah. I don't have, personally, I don't have those those thoughts because i i never have thought that yeah if i portray that i mean i would i would repent yeah i was like that Same is here. not who i am or do not want to portray at all yeah. but i also there's a lot of guys who i know and care deeply about and respect that have become more what i would consider to be woke in their mm. their ideology of things and and even their approach to scripture and it's like okay so I'm just here's my question yeah. is being woke is that the new form of crossing that bridge or is that a cuz I'm I'm just like ah there's some things about that that's that's marxist that's there's not there's not truth in there but it's like am I uh is there too big of a chasm or can I am I not even trying to bridge that chasm those are some of the questions I've been asking what is that today that's 
similar to what they dealt with in, the, in that day? And is there something that could be behavior change, tweaks, whatever it needed to be? Because that's what Chuck Smith did. He said, all right, uh, yeah, come in. And then, yeah. you know, it just kind of expanded from there. Well, I think we can go back and look at how he responded to that day. I don't think he personally became a hippie. That's true. Or he, no, endorsed, for sure. Yeah, he didn't endorse the disestablishment concept that was going around at that time or the, the nihilistic um, and uh, different ideas of uh, Marcuse and, and Sartre or anything like he did not diminish the gospel message is the point i'm getting at That's true. No, no. he didn't embrace the ideology but what he did is he was willing to open a dialogue yeah i think today obviously we see the the nihilism and the brokenness in the woke ideology yeah and so when we look at that there there's not when truth compromises with error, there was an old Minnesota pastor, I believe it was from Minnesota, that used to say this, and I forget his name right now. When truth compromises with error, it's always truth that loses because error has nothing to give up in the first place. Yeah, right. So we, truth can't compromise with error. On the other hand, we can sit down in, in genuine Christian love, speak truth in love, yeah. genuinely love someone. And what I get a sense of from Chuck Smith's legacy is that he genuinely showed the love of Christ mm -hmm. by, I think there was a scene in the movie where he literally is there washing. People had been yeah, complaining that they're tracking sand in yeah, the church. Yeah. He's like, all, all right, right, I'll wash the feet. Let me wash your feet. It was so sweet. That was, now, that's powerful it, to me. I know really, I was looking at that. I was yeah, getting it was, choked up. It, it was, was powerful. Oh. Okay. So, but, but, okay. So there's churches that, that are flying the, uh, the uh, rainbow flag. Oh yeah. Okay. Is that, is that bridging that gap? Is that are they doing something that I don't know, that it would be Chuck Smith esque, mm. in your opinion? What's your thoughts on? I these? think it was something that Chuck Smith would have adamantly opposed. And here's the point. Let's go backwards a little bit. J. Gresham Machen wrote a great book uh, on uh, on liberal Christianity in the 1920s. I forget the specific year, but the point of the entire book was this: that in the, the realm of Christianity today, and here's what his contention was, and I think he proves it well, liberal Christianity is not Christianity. Here's his point. They're making statements about the person of Christ that if you go backwards throughout, at that point, 1900 years of Orthodox Christianity and any other phase in the Christian faith that would have said that is not Christian. Hmm to diminish the deity of Christ. Well, my goodness, for yeah. 180 years from the Council of Nicaea to the Council of Chalcedon, we had that conversation already. So if you're going to step away from the deity of Christ, then yeah. you're not Christian. And his whole point yeah. is, That's right. there are people that call themselves church that have that fly different kinds of flags all over the place. But mm. to be honest, in the historic Orthodox sense, yeah. they are not Christian. Yeah. And so we just have to be honest with it. Well, and then I, it's, and I, I would agree with you. I, I think you know they are. They would say they're not. They're not being condemning, and it's like. But I do think you're condoning, and I think there's a way. Yeah. You know, we've had we've had same sex couples attend here, mm -hmm. and you know, and I've I know who they are are, and uh, you know, I certainly made went out of my way to make them hopefully feel make them feel welcome. Wonderful. Um, yeah. And I certainly don't pull out some kind of special sermon that's going to be condemning or, you know, Absolutely. harsh or anything. It's like, you know, I want, you know, everybody needs to know Jesus. We're all sinners. We're all the, the grounds level at the foot of the cross. But there, there's, I don't know, there's always issues that you, in our day that are so, so difficult and so hard mm -hmm. to, to speak in a way that sounds, that would become across gentle or loving just because the, like, well, I can't, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm always gonna preach for the, and and side on the side of uh, protecting the innocence of our right. children. Right. Well, that's gonna come across to hate to some ears, and it's like mm -hmm. I don't know how you avoid it. But anyway, right. that's yeah. that's a, kind of an aside. But it's really the world we live in. Right. And so, anyway, that's a question. I when I came out of that movie, I just I started thinking of all kinds. It's like, what does this look like? What are, I guess uh, if you had to summarize the takeaway, it is to be kind toward every person. It's just like. Yeah, you, you know, if you have the someone for sure, absolutely. No and you what. still speak the truth. And that's the reason why. So Cheyenne Hills Church, uh, 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 Capital City Church, Calvary Chapel Church, uh, and a number of others. 
when they focus on the scripture and they teach the scripture word for word, line by line, precept by precept, and they're focused in on that and they love every person that comes in, but they also love them enough to share the truth in love, then that is a safe place. So it's not a matter of accepting or rejecting an ideology. It's staying true and faithful to the word of God. And I know you do that. And that's what a good Christian church would do. Well, I think... I think it's a good exercise. I don't think we're reaching the the millennial to the degree that we would like to, and I it's always broken my heart for that reason. And it's like I don't want it to be, you know, I don't know, political or I don't know. I just right. it's like I don't want to do anything that would would isolate anybody. It's like from knowing that they can have a relationship with Jesus because you know we right. all started at a, some spot, and usually it wasn't where we ended up. That's right. God's made That's us true. made us a little different, but. Anyway, when you're 60 years old, sometimes you need to reevaluate on what are the square places that need to be chopped off. And I've been yeah. I've been going through this drill. So thank you for yeah, just at least entering into the conversation. I think it's profitable. And I, I, I love that relationship because this is a big issue and it's important for us to. It is. Well, as always, people in this world, I don't know how else you do it, but you got to be strong and you got to be very courageous. God bless you guys. 